You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. Well, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 13. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Now, there, there are things that in our lives we're familiar with, things that we know of, things that are common to us, uh, and uh, things that we may readily use. Uh, and yet, in those things, however common they are, and however much use they get in our lives, or whatever we may know, we often don't think of all the implications of what we know, of the things we do, uh, of how we live. And therefore, uh, there are things that we miss, and there are things that we, we end up living in inconsistency with. And so it's important that in what we know and how we live, that we do think through all of those implications. And I, I think that's very true when it comes to technology. You know, what are all the implications of technology? There may be uh, good things in it that are helpful and, and, and that we can see a lot of uh, good come from it. And, and yet there can also be implications of it that are really just scary and bad. And we need to be willing to think through those implications. And one thing I think about is uh, social media. I mean, how many of us in one way or another have some kind of presence on social media? And there's a lot of good that comes out of social media, right? I mean, there are some who are on social media have a gospel presence, and that's great, and, and trying to spread the word and, and, and be an example to others and, and share Jesus Christ uh, as, as far reaching as they can. And that's, that's a great and awesome thing. And there are those that are on social media just to stay connected, uh, that they can see pictures of their grandkids or, or, or stay up to date with those who, who live far away from them that they, they love and are close to. And now that's well and good. Uh, but there's also a lot that has come out of social media that isn't so good. Uh, there is a lot in the past few years that we have seen of a, a, a growing at such a rapid rate that has only been allowed because of social media uh, of a mob-like mentality towards different things uh, in our society that are not good and not righteous. Uh, there are a lot of things that have been, uh, a lot of ways that social media has been used to propagate different ideas and, and to cause them to spread more rapidly than we've ever been able to see uh, an idea and ideology grow among people uh, at any point in history uh, that have been for a, a negative result of things. And so we need to think through the implications of things. And, and that is also true, not just when it comes to technology, not just when it comes to social media, not when, just when it comes to different things that are in our lives, but that's also true when it comes to our theology, when it comes to what we believe. We need to be willing to think deeply on the implications of what we believe, lest that we believe in, in inconsistency, uh, unless that uh, we believe in error without looking to the Scriptures and saying, what do the Scriptures say about these things, and what are the implications of that for my life and how I live? And so as we are drawing a close to our, our Christmas celebration, as we come to the, the final sermon in our Christmas series, I want us to think on the things that we've been discussing and what we celebrate at Christmas, that this ch child who was born laid in a manger is Christ the Lord, that he is our Savior, that he is God made flesh. What are the implications of that for our very lives? What does that mean for us as we live? What does that mean for us as a church and that's what we specifically want to focus on this morning. What does that mean for us in our interaction with each other? And the unity that we have together, and the love and, and sacrifice that we show towards one another. What are the implications of the incarnation of God becoming a man for our lives? We want to think that through, and that's why we're looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And as we turn to this letter it's a letter written by the Apostle Paul, written to the saints in Christ in the city of Philippi. And it was addressed also to their overseers, or that also refers to their elders or their pastors. 
And it was addressed too, as well, to the deacons. There in Philippi, that was the, the first church there in Macedonia where Paul planted a church. That was the first church planted by Paul. And this is one of the prison epistles, along with Ephesians or Colossians and Philemon, meaning that Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison. And the evidence points to uh, this letter to the Philippians being written during Paul's, Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. And he wrote this letter to what overall was a healthy church. And also, many note that this is one of Paul's more emotional letters, as he expresses such joy for this church. But all of that does not mean that this was a perfect church. Uh, just as we talked about when we went through First and Second Thessalonians, that that was a healthy church, but it was by far a perfect church. And what we discussed then is that there is no such thing as a perfect church. We will not find one. All of us together have something wrong. All of us uh, have room to grow and, and must recognize that we have room to grow. And we here at North Valley are no different, and that church in Philippi was no different. And so I think that's part of a reason, too, why we should look into these things all the more and take these things to heart. And one of the areas that the Philippians had to grow in was in their unity. Uh, we're here in chapter 2 now. Later on in the letter, Paul will talk about two women, Judea and Syneche. Uh, they had a disagreement with each other. And maybe that was the most significant disagreement in the church. Maybe there was other disagreements as well. Uh, maybe the church with these two ladies were taking sides on whatever this division was over. But in any case, Paul addresses that specifically. Uh, but as we see as he goes through this letter, there were things that obviously was causing division within this church, and, and Paul calls for unity among them. And as he calls for this unity, he points to the attitude that can be seen in Christ. Specifically, the attitude that's demonstrated in Christ's incarnation, in Christ being God who became man. Or, in, as the text specifically here this morning puts it, in what's called the kenosis of Christ. Kenosis is, comes from the Greek word to, meaning to empty. And we'll talk through what exactly did Christ empty himself of. But as we go through this, and we see the example that's in Christ, that Paul calls the Philippians to look at and to mimic uh, in their pursuit of unity... So where was I? <laughs> Anybody know? Yeah. Just kidding. The outline, I think that's where I was at. So what we see here as we go through this passage is that in verses 1 through 4, we'll see the, the explanation of the unity that Paul calls for each believer to have towards one another. And then in verses 5 through 8, we see the example of such unity in Christ, in his kenosis, in his emptying of himself. And then in verses 9 through 11, it tells us of God the Father's response to Christ's obedience, to Christ humbling himself, in emptying himself. And then finally, in verses 12 through 13, we see Paul's call for the Philippians' obedience in light of Christ's obedience, in light of Christ's humility, and exaltation. And so with that said, let us read our passage here for this morning. Again, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, and any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, 
who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So as we start off here, and we look at these first four verses to begin with. We see the, the explanation of the unity that Paul is calling for. The English Standard Version, which is what I'm reading from here, uh, starts chapter 2 by saying, So if. Other translations say, therefore, if. And what Paul wrote here refers back to what he said in chapter 1, specifically going back to verse 27. Paul called them to live in such a way that was worthy of the gospel of Christ. And Paul called them to this because whether or not he, he came to them, if he was able to get out of prison and was come, able to come to see them, or whether or not he got a message about them, Paul wanted to know that they were a church that was unified together. And that they were unified, firm in one spirit, as he says there in verse 27, firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And as he were to keep going there in verse 28 through 30, there in chapter 1, they were to be this way even in light of suffering and of those who would oppose them. And Paul was calling them to this unity, even as disunity was growing from within, as we've already mentioned. And so Paul draws a logical conclusion saying that in reference to the fact that he was calling them that they should be striving firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith, because of that, Paul says, therefore, or so, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from love, if any participation in the Spirit, if any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Now, though, as you read through the English Standard Version here, it doesn't repeat if throughout that verse. In the Greek, it does keep repeating the word if. Paul says if, or it could also have the force of a... uh, a certainty, or that the idea of the implication, uh, implying the fact that this is the case, if we're going to assume this is the case, or again, to certainty, since this is true, that you have any encouragement in Christ, since it's true, you have any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, since you really have any affection and sympathy, because of this, If these conditions were the case, all of these things which true believers partake in together, share in together, all of these things should motivate unity among believers, should motivate unity among us together. And if you have these things, Paul says, then make my joy complete. Now, Paul clearly found his joy in Christ that he would rejoice always in Christ, as he told the Philippians to in chapter 4. But nonetheless, his life and concern was also wrapped up in those whom the Lord drew to himself through Paul's ministry. Paul cared for his converts, as we'll see elsewhere, that Paul cared for them like a father cares for his child. And so as such, Paul wanted them to do well. He wanted them to be growing and walking in the Lord. And so he makes this personal plea, make my joy complete. If this is true of you, if these circumstances are true among you, make my joy complete. Be unified together then. And so we see in all of this uh, the conditions that motivate unity. 
that would result in Paul's joy being complete. And so we see of these conditions, the first one he mentions is encouragement in Christ. The word translated here as encouragement is the word uh, that means coming alongside of someone for the purpose of encouragement or counsel or exhortation. And so what's true of everyone who has faith in Jesus Christ is that in Christ they have help. They have help. And none of us are alone in our pursuit of putting off sin. None of us are alone in the difficulties that we face in life, in our striving for holiness and unity. And yes, when it comes to unity, we are to be striving for it. We should not think that unity will just come naturally to us. As a matter of fact, Paul in the book of Ephesians, he told the Ephesians that they were to be bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And there in Ephesians, the word to maintain, it's in the active voice. This is what believers are to be doing. Uh, the unity among us is, is not passively kept. We are responsible to maintain that unity. And why? Why do we have to work at it? Why do we have to strive for the maintaining of the unity among us? Because we sin. And we're sinned against. And in my flesh, when I'm sinned against, I'd rather have nothing to do with you. And when I sin against you, you'd rather just write me off. That's how we are in the flesh. That's how we are uh, as we strive to put off our natural selves but still struggle with it. And so we must strive for this unity, recognizing that we have a bond together that is stronger than the urgings of our flesh. It is greater than our hurts and our annoyances. And so in that, we're to never really hold a grudge. We are to be repenting and extending the forgiveness the Lord has shown to us when someone repents. And Christ, through his spirit in us, comes and he encourages us in this. He exhorts us in this. He empowers us in striving for this unity in this way. And so again, that first condition is the encouragement that's in Christ. If we have that, we should be striving for unity, maintaining the unity among us. And then the, the second condition is comfort from love, or it could be translated as love's consolation or, or love's comfort. And we know this love, this love that brings comfort, because we know this love from the Lord. When we recognize our sin against our Lord, when our hearts are, are turned in repentance, that we have sinned against the very one who has given us life, that we have sinned against him who has loved us and sent his son for us to redeem us, that the son of God loved me and gave himself for me, and yet I've sinned against him. I have disobeyed his word. I have been unholy and unrighteous, only earning his wrath. And yet though I am so unworthy, though I have sinned against him, He's brought salvation through his son. He has granted repentance and faith. And in this, the love of the Lord brings comfort to us, even as we recognize our sin and recognize how sinful we are. He comforts us, and he comforts us in our sin, uh, bringing us to repentance, and he comforts us in all of our trials. And then in response, we are to then turn and comfort one another in the same love that we have been comforted with from the Lord. And as we express this comfort to one another, unity grows between us. It motivates this unity. So if there's any encouragement in Christ and any comfort in this love, we should be pursuing unity. And then the third condition is the participation in or the fellowship in the Spirit. If we have put our faith in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, 
If we are indeed saved, standing in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit indwells us. We share together in him. We have this in common together. And this result of the gospel is one of the main aspects of our unity together. So much so that scripture calls this unity, unity in the spirit. He is shaping us. He is strengthening us, motivating us, changing us. All who truly are saved by God's grace. He is God's presence with us. He's the catalyst of our pursuit of holiness and our pursuit of unity together. You know, and Paul makes clear in Romans chapter 8 that if we do not have the Spirit, we don't have Christ, and therefore we're not truly saved. But if we have the Spirit, we have this fellowship together. We have the very empowerment for our unity together as we grow together in the Lord. So we see these conditions again. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, if we have the participation, the fellowship in the Spirit, and then fourthly, if there's any affection and sympathy. Now, we may look at that and say, how, how can affection be a condition for pursuing this unity and making Paul's joy complete? I mean, we might think that that can no more be a condition than God can command our emotions and our feelings. I mean, can God command our feelings? I can't help how I feel. Well, uh, I think we can. <laughs> Not that it's easy, but we've discussed this before. How way too often we allow ourselves to be led by our emotions. That we do as we feel. But that's not biblical. And instead of being led by our emotions, we should be leading our emotions. We should be working to bring them into alignment with, with God's word and his truth and, and what he calls us to in our lives. And so, for instance, when it comes to our affection towards one another, if we find that we have no affection towards a brother or sister in Christ, what should we then do about that? Well, one thing, we should be in prayer for that person and ourselves. Praying God would be working in our hearts and praying for the good of that person. Praying that God would be working in them and blessing them, pursuing their good. And then, two, not only just praying for them, but we ourselves then should be actively serving them, coming together with them and building a relationship with them, talking with them, getting to know them more and deeper, ex expressing love towards them. And if the situation is such that the reason we lack affection is because maybe they've hurt us, then we should go to them and talk to them about that. Uh, maybe they don't even recognize that they've hurt you. There have been plenty of times where I've been so dim-witted that I have done something or said something that hurt someone else, that was sinful towards someone else, and I didn't even recognize it. And if they never came and talked to me, I would have never known. But we need to do that. We need to go to each other and, and, and talk through those circumstances that, that bring division. When there's sin between us, we need to do our part to bring reconciliation with one another. And so as we pursue this, we can bring our affections in line with what God's word is calling us to. We can lead our emotions instead of being led by our emotions. And that's what we need to do. So we're to have affection towards one another. And we're to have sympathy. Uh, this word sympathy is, is often translated as mercy. We should act with mercy towards one another, being kind, gentle, and patient with one another. As we live with each other in an understanding way, having concern for one another. And as we think of these four conditions, not one of, the, of us have these things nailed down tight. But we should be asking ourselves, are we growing in these things, progressively moving forward in these things? Are we coming alongside of each other to help each other grow in these conditions? 
Now, through these things, we grow in unity with one another in, in that we will be of the same mind. That, that's part of how Paul describes this unity, being of the same mind. Now, that doesn't mean we have to agree on everything with each other, right? There are plenty of things that we are going to disagree on. Though we must stand together on the foundational truth, the essential truths of God's word and the faith. There are plenty of things that we can disagree on and agree to disagree and maintain that unity. But in that, in having, being of the same mind, we should be aiming together with the attitude, striving together that the word of God is going to shape our thinking and our understanding and that we are going to grow together in our unity with one another, that we have the same aims towards one another, with the same attitude for the glory of God in our lives, with our minds being shaped, again, by God's word and the power of the Spirit. And with these conditions, we will also have the same love. Now, when it says to have the same love, I think that makes it very clear this is not talking about emotional love uh, because we are not going to have the same love for one another emotionally. Uh, uh, we, we can't and we shouldn't. I mean, for instance, I love Suzanne, but I don't love the rest of you the same way I love Suzanne. And I won't and I shouldn't, right? And so clearly this is not talking about an emotional love, but this is talking about a love in our actions towards each other, how we treat one another, as we read in 1 John 3, that love is to be in truth and deeds. And when we do this, we're pursuing unity. And then the next thing, too, unity is described as being in full accord. Or as the, the New American Standard Bible, the 95 edition, puts it, unity in spirit. This is the idea that we will be in harmony with one another. And then finally, we see this is described as being of one mind. Or again, as the New American Standard puts it, intent on one purpose. Ultimately, we all have the same purpose. To glorify God in being the church that he has called us to be. In living lives that he has called us to live that are worthy of the gospel. And I think in the context here, again, this is referring back to chapter 1, verse 27. And so that we would have the same purpose in our striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. This is what Paul told the Philippians it means to be unified. And there may be other aspects of unity that are important, but these are the things that were important for the Philippians. And so the things that Paul communicated to them. And these things are important for us as well. If we do not have these things, we won't be unified. We need to be striving for these among ourselves, growing together in these things. And if we are people who are going to be selfish and full of ourselves, then we're never going to achieve the unity that is talked about here. We're never going to grow in these conditions unless we're willing to strive for the good of others and lay aside ourselves and what we want and our opinions and our selfish desires. That we would pursue our own recognition and our own glory. That we would get the pat on the backs that we're looking for. Or that we want certain people to think a certain way about us. If we can lay all of that aside, we can pursue the unity together. But if we can't get out of the way so that I don't just look to my own interests, but look to the interests of others. If I can't do that, then I'm going to be part of what harms and hurts the church, instead of being one that is being used by God to build up his church. Instead of being one who is doing my part to bear with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. If I'm not doing that, then where is my growth in maturity? If I'm not doing that, then where is my growth in Christ-likeness? 
Because to have such an attitude is to be growing in Christ-likeness. And so again, this is where the implications of what we celebrate at Christmas, this is where they come in. That Christ, in his incarnation, in his taking on a human nature, he left an example for us to follow of such selflessness, of such sacrifice, of such humility. And we should then strive to follow that example and be like Christ. So Paul says in verse 5, have this mind or this attitude. And this is a command that Paul is giving. Have this attitude among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Unity means having this attitude that was in Christ. That attitude of humility, of sacrifice. And so again, it calls us to be like Christ, who, as verse 6 says, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He was in the the form of God. That is to say that he existed long before Bethlehem, long before the the angel appeared to Mary in Nazareth, but that in eternity past, he existed with his very nature, the unchanging reality about himself as being God. And he is clearly God, As when it says there, in the form of God, that's parallel to when it says equality with God. So Jesus' very nature, before his conception, was as equal with God. But this equality with God, he saw as something not to grasp or something not to hold on to for the sake of his own advantage. Instead, verse 7 says, he emptied himself. And then the question is, then, what did he empty himself of? Well, as Paul just said, he did not count equality with God a thing to be held onto for his own advantage. So when he emptied himself, he emptied himself of his rights to act as God on earth. And I think we see this in a few different ways. We can see some examples of this. Uh, For instance, when he had been fasting, For 40 days, and then Satan tempts him in the wilderness. Satan tempts him by saying, turn these stones into bread. Use your your authority and power as God for your own advantage. Go ahead, turn these stones into bread. And he wouldn't. I think, too, we see an example of this in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, when Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and offer his life a ransom for many. This is the humility of our Lord. This is him taking on flesh and emptying himself. But he who was equal with God, God in his very nature, took on the nature of a slave. I know the English Standard Version here says servant, as do most English translations, but the Greek word is slave, as it's rightly translated by the Net Bible and by the Legacy Standard Bible. Again, he came to serve and give his life a ransom for many. That's the very purpose in him taking on the form of a slave. So again, he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave, and emptied himself by being born in the likeness of men. And in this, then, we can see his emptying himself as being the fact, uh, as one commentator put it, that, that God became human, that the Lord became a slave. But it's not just that. It continues and goes further, that he humbled himself. We see that when he came in humanity, he presented himself before others as a man, And so being found in human likeness, he humbled himself. And as we see the end of verse 8, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He who is equal with God emptied himself by becoming a slave, by taking on humanity and humbling himself to such a lowly slavehood that he would give up his very life. And even giving up his life on a cross. Uh, Paul shows the extent of his humility. And also, too, I think in this, Paul shows the horrors of the cross when he says that he 
He humbled himself to death, even death, on a cross. If anyone came to this earth deserving to be served, it was him. He deserves to be honored. He is worthy of our worship, yet he humbled himself to the most devastating humility. And this is the example Paul is saying that the church is to follow. We are to empty ourselves of all of our rights and become slaves of others. Whether or not we we get the recognition we think we deserve, or whether or not uh, serving someone feels good to us, or that we'll get the desired outcome that we want, or whatever other selfish ambition we could be looking for, instead, we are to be like Christ. We have to grow in Christ-likeness. And then, and only then, can we be of the same mind, having the same love, united in one spirit with one purpose. Because then we will be emptied of all of our selfishness and conceited ambitions. Man, (laughs) do I have some selfishness in me. (laughs) Uh, Can I be conceited? Yeah. More than I'd like to admit. And I need help. I I can't be like Christ on my own. God must grow me more and more into Christ-likeness. And that's true of all of us. And he has given of his Holy Spirit to us, to grow us. And all of us who are saved having the Holy Spirit, we also must be there for each other. As he has placed us together here in this church, he has placed us together here in North Valley. Uh, We're not here by accident. It's not just happenstance or I made a decision to come here or whatever it might be. If you're here, if you're part of this church, it's because God has sovereignly brought you here for his purposes for his glory. And he has brought us together by his sovereignty that we would be the people together to come alongside of each other and to press each other on and growing towards Christ-likeness. It's not by accident that we're here. God in his wisdom. Now we may may look around at each other and say, (laughs) well, wisdom in bringing this group of people together. Right? Right? I mean, I do feel bad for you. I mean, you have to bear in love with me, right? Uh, You have to maintain the unity even with me here. And and I got to bear with you. (laughs) So uh, we all have to do this together. As we press on towards Christ's likeness together, recognizing that it is our sovereign God who has brought us together to do this. We are the church he is building. For his purposes. We're not here by accident. He has brought us together by his sovereignty to love each other and bear with one one another. And what's the result of this? Throughout scripture, uh, there is the theme of God bringing low the proud and exalting the humble. And since Christ emptied himself, since Christ emptied himself in such humility. For this reason, we see in verse 9, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And so God exalted Christ to the highest place where he appeared on earth as a man. His equality with God is now understood. And though it's not explicitly mentioned here in this text, the way God did this was through the resurrection and his ascension back to the right hand of God the Father. And the name God bestowed on him is the name Lord. The name Lord. As we discussed, the name of God, Yahweh, which was translated in the Greek translation of the Old Testament as Lord, this name then denotes equality with God. And the purpose of this, or the result of this, of God giving him this name, is seen in verses 10 and 11. When it says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All creation confesses Jesus as Lord. Uh, This seems to be taken from the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament from Isaiah 45, verse 23, where Yahweh says that before him, the Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue will swear or confess that in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. And this again then shows that Paul is pointing to Christ's equality with Yahweh, the one true God. No knee should bow and no tongue confess to anyone else as Lord. No government, no hierarchy, no desire, no nothing. No one but Jesus Christ who is Lord. He is the only sovereign. He is the only sovereign to the glory of God the Father. So we see in this text, the Father glorifies God the Son to the glory of God the Father. There is one God worthy of glory and honor. And that God exists in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you will bow the knee to your Lord. Many have pointed out, and rightly so, that you will either bow to his lordship now or when he returns. Bow now while his grace is offered, when you trust in him for your salvation. Don't wait until he returns, because then when he returns, you'll be forced to bow before him as you come to know his wrath against your sin and rebellion. Christ humbled himself to death on a cross to pay for the rebellion of all who would trust in him, to pay for all of our sin, for any time we have lied, for any time we have um, been selfish and, and, and jealous of what others have had and, and not content and grateful for what we have. Whenever we have not given God the proper place in our lives, whenever we've taken his name in vain, he humbled himself to death. And in dying, he died to pay for the sins of all who would trust in him. For all who would believe on him, and he rose again to forever intercede for those he saves as their high priest. Trust in him who is your Lord. Trust in him now for the forgiveness of your sins, for your right standing before God. Trust in him in whom alone is righteousness and strength. Trust in him because you and I have no righteousness. Our righteousness can only be found by trusting in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, knowing that he is our righteousness. Knowing that he was good enough for us, who could never be good enough to work our way to heaven. He was righteous for us, who are sinners. Now, let's not lose why Paul tells us of God's exalting Christ. He does so because Christ humbled himself. And Paul is presenting Christ as the example for Jesus' disciples to follow and to follow in order to maintain the necessary unity in the church. That we would be like our Lord and humble ourselves with sacrifice, entrusting ourselves to this great God who brings low the proud and exalts the humble for his honor and his glory. And there is no greater example of humility and no higher exaltation than that of our Lord. Who being the God of glory, humbled himself to a virgin's womb, to be born and laid in an animal's feeding trough, to grow and live as human as any of us except without sin, to grow and preach all his father told him to say, to be rejected by men and nailed to a cross, to take on himself the sin and guilt of his own people whom he saves, of all who would believe on him by faith, to die in our place, suffering the wrath of God in our place, to rise on the third day, and then to ascend to the right hand of power and glory, to be coming back one day in full glory and power, to one day judge this unbelieving world. And in view of this humility, The Apostle Paul called the Philippians to obedience, to obediently pursue unity. He says in verses 12 through 13, Therefore, my beloved, 
as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We are to work out our salvation with our obedience. Not that one's obedience saves them, but instead, having been saved, God is working in us to bring about our obedience. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Again, we, we obey not to be saved, but because we have been saved, we now work out that salvation. It's, the again, the outworking of our salvation. And we're responsible then to obey. So then if we do not obey... It's on us that we haven't done as we should, that we haven't pursued this unity. And yet if we do obey, God gets all the glory because, again, it's him who works in us to both will and to work for his good pleasure. And so, again, we should not think of this obedience as passive, that God's just going to do and I just sit back and do nothing. No, I'm responsible, and yet God gets all the glory because it is his work in us. Brothers and sisters, if we are saved, then we recognize the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. That yes, he is returning one day to reign, and he will rule over the nations with an iron scepter. The earth will see his sovereign reign, as he is the hope of the nations. But even now, he reigns with all authority in heaven and on earth. Remember, your Savior is Christ the Lord. Live in obedience to your Lord. Live loving your Lord in all that you do because of all that he is and all that he has done. And for those who continue to live instead as they desire, according to their own standard of right and wrong, and do not submit to their Lord, there's a warning in this truth. He is Lord. And you will one day bow to your Lord. But bow today. Trust in him for who he is and what he has done to save sinners, to bring his own to God, and begin today to live for the greatest thing that you can live your life for, the glory of God. Why waste any more time in living for yourself when you can today, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the power of this very God, live for him in his glory? Jesus is Lord. Jesus reigns. And all the earth is his. For us who believe, as we work out our salvation, let us strive again in obedience for this unity that Paul calls the church to. By making ourselves slaves of all, by giving of ourselves for one another, doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility counting others more significant than ourselves. As we follow the example of our Lord. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.